Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session, Myanmar's Spring Revolution and the Rohingya Genocide. My name is Chloe, and I'll be chairing this morning. First up, some important information for your convenience. The toilets are up on the first floor. They can be accessed by the stairs or by the elevator on the ground floor, just past the loading bay. The loading bay is on the ground floor where food will be served and where many of the information tables are. Green Left is the host of this conference, and if you are motivated to become a socialist activist, you can either join us or stay in touch. Please talk with us about this if you have any questions. A contact list will be going around. There is also an information table about us in the Loading Bay area. And please use the hashtag EcoSocialism2023 with any tweeting or other social media posts about the conference. We acknowledge that we are meeting on the Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation and that this land was never ceded. It was taken by force and the struggle for First Nation sovereignty is deeply connected with the struggles against racism, imperialism and capitalism. As socialists, we pledge to actively fight for decolonization and against all the manifestations of that, such as children being stolen from their parents and communities, the poverty gap, the debts and custody, this always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And welcome everyone and also welcome to the people joining us on the live stream. Two years ago in Burma, Myanmar, the military overthrew the democratically elected National League for Democracy, the NLD government. As we all saw on our TV screens, when the Burmese people demonstrated their disapproval, the military unleashed a brutal repression. The protest movement known locally as the Myanmar Spring Revolution continues to mobilize and has recently taken up armed resistance against the repressive military. At the same time, the Rohingya people have been suffering from repeated genocidal attacks by the Burmese military since 2017. This made it easier for the military to carry out the coup against the ruling NLD government. In this session, you will hear from seasoned activists as they reflect on, on the Myanmar Spring Revolution and the nature of the Rohingya genocide and why it needs to be opposed. In a few seconds, you will be addressed by two speakers. After the speakers, I will take a list of those who are here who would like to contribute, so please indicate to me by raising your hand. Each contribution should be no longer than three minutes, and I will inform contributors if I, when I, um, I'll give you three minutes to wrap up. Sorry, you'll have three minutes to make your contribution, and I'll let you know when it's time to wrap up. These procedures facilitate a fair, inclusive discussion. And I would like to welcome our speakers for today. We have Habib Bu Rahman. Habib is a founder and spokesperson of the Australian Burmese Rohingya organization. Welcome, comrade. And, and we have also joining us online, Mong Zani, or Dr. Zani, is a research fellow at the Genocide Documentation Center, Cambodia, co-founder of 4C.co, a progressive activist and intellectual platform for Southeast Asian activists and Burmese coordinator of the Free Rohingya Coalition. And Zani lives in exile in London, and it's we know it's very late there, uh, Zani, or early, rather, 1 a.m., so we are grateful that you could speak at this hour. And just to let people know, Zani might have to leave the session 10 to 20 minutes early, uh, but, yeah, I'll hand it over to you now. Zani, thanks for your patience. Thank you so much, Chloe. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you to everybody who um, attends this morning session. Um, I'm sorry, I can't be there in person, but um, you know, with the technology, I'm still able to, um, you know, share my thoughts on Myanmar Spring or Burmese uh, Revolution. Um, it locally it is known as Nui U Tolan Ye. Also, we didn't really have, um, you know, spring as such. What we have is early um, summer, so it, it started in March, and so it's very early um, summertime um, in Burma. But 
in English um, for um, convenience sake, we just use the word uh, Myanmar's brain. Um, so uh, what I want to do in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, um, it's to explain the background um, of the, um, the Burmese uprisings um, that was um, triggered by the violent um, um, crackdown by the Burmese military uh, in the um, month of February, um, March, and until now. So it's two and a half years on the Burmese um, spring or Burmese revolution continues. As you know, um, you know, for the last uh, 30 years, uh, um, Obama has been in the international headlines. Around 1988, we had uh, the first um, nationwide wave of uh, uprising um, that ended the um, military dictatorship of General Ne Win, um, which ruled the country you know, under the banner of um, Burmese way to socialism. Essentially, it's dictatorship, uh, murderous, and the also it started the uh, process of genocide against the Rohingya people in the late 1970s. Um, so that same military dictatorship um, took off the military uniform, you know, civilianized the um, the generals, but they continue to impose their will on <laughs> on the country um, in in a in a rather repressive way for the first twenty six years. That's nineteen sixty two to nineteen eighty eight. As I said a minute ago, um, the Burmese popular uprising that um, erupted as a nationwide protest ended the, um, the Socialist Party, which was essentially the military that called itself a socialist, um, not the kind of uh, socialism with uh, reflection, freedom, and uh, sensitivity to ecological crisis that uh, Equal Socialism Conference uh, this year uh, would signify. So from 1988 all the way to 2015, you know, Burma continued to be ruled by, um, you know, various types of military leaderships, um, you know, outright um, military junta to quasi democratic uh, military rule with the veneer of uh, you know, democratic reforms. And then in 2015, Aung San Suu Kyi and her National League for Democracy Party, the uh, the largest flagship um, you know, democratic party, uh, most popular with the Burman or the Burmese majoritarian public, mostly um, Buddhist. And also we have um, other uh, non-Buddhist and non-Burmese um, nationalities, and 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 uh, even many of them had supported Aung San Suu Kyi um, and her leadership. So her leadership was not a hundred percent powerful in the sense that um, the twenty-five percent of the parliamentary seats were constitutionally allocated to the military and nothing significant in terms of um, changes in the constitutional clauses and articles could be uh, carried out uh, without um, you know, military's approval because mathematically that constitution which put Aung San Suu Kyi and her party in power through popular polls 
um, was uh, it was impossible for Aung San Suu Kyi and the, the, um, the civilian Democratic Party to change anything that the military did not approve uh, constitutionally uh, speaking. Every change required um, 75 plus 1% of the um, um, votes within that um, parliament and 25% um, was a block vote um, that was in the sole control of the military. And so the military set up this constitution that was designed to keep the military in the country's driving seat uh, with absolutely no sunset clause, meaning the military had indicated no time frame you know, in which it will completely withdraw from the country's um, national and local politics and return to the barracks and behave as professional armies or armed forces, um, you know, befitting a democratic system. But nonetheless, there is something else that was going on. And everybody who knew remotely about the Burmese <laughs> political inner workings um, and, you know, the design of the military realized that this constitution uh, adopted by the military in 2008 um, would not allow any type of genuine democratic reforms to take place. But the international community, uh, including Australia, US, UK, and other um, you know, democracies uh, around the world, uh, not to mention other authoritarian regimes, and the United Nations play along with the so-called democratic reforms in Myanmar, because now the world had uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, a famed uh, former political prisoner. Um, often or in in the past uh, likened with uh, Nelson Mandela or Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. She also visited uh, you know, Sydney and, and Canberra. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Because she was there as the facade of the democratic reforms um, or the quasi-democratic transition uh, that the military had overseen, the international community found it convenient or strategically convenient uh, to resume business as usual um, in a country that was seen as one of the last economic frontiers. Um, you know, Chloe talked about colonization. This is a form of uh, economic uh, colonization that was uh, enabled by the uh, facade of democratic reform with Aung San Suu Kyi um, as the the politician or the leader presiding over this process. And so all the sanctions were lifted, uh, the everything was renormalized and the the world had to, you know uh, widely celebrated. And I would say, in retrospect, uh, it turned out, um, you know, um, the prematurely celebrated Burmese Spring. And two things happened. Um, one was, um, you know, the um, the the corporation led uh, globalization sprinted in Myanmar, and all just about every. A major investor rushed in because there was democratic transition happening. The military and Aung San Suu Kyi were working together after a quarter century of uh, mutual hostilities and antagonism. And so therefore, uh, Burma is now 
good for business. So as many of you will know, uh, the country is very resource rich, um, a former British colony, uh, teak, natural gas, and to a lesser extent, oil, um, the um, you know rare earth, other minerals, you know strategic minerals, as well as you know um, gemstones, whatnot. So and also it's a sizable um, um, export market. Um, you know, fifty million people. Um, that's fifty million consumers in the eyes of the international investors. Um, the, so the, a market of fifty fifty five million people is no small. Uh, uh, market and so it's very attractive and also Burma has um, a cheap supply of um, labor all these things and also of course that it's uh, across the the long and porous borders with the two of the uh, largest uh, economies in the world China and India and then there is um, Thailand next door uh, medium income country so if that Burma became a, a the latest um, you know economic boom for investors and co uh, corporate sector. But the military started to worry that even with Aung San Suu Kyi, um, you know, running the quasi democratic reform process. Um, with all the limitations imposed on any civilian government, not just Suu Kyi, uh, any other government within this 2008 constitution, would at some point, um, you know, overwhelm the military's ability to control this process. And now on top of that, um, there is a very well-known personal rivalry or like almost a mutual hatred of each other the the head of the burmese armed forces mayor line uh, the gen senior general he calls himself and Aung San Suu Kyi, they are known to be allergic to each other both they're extremely ambitious and the, you know the the, the obviously Aung San Suu Kyi is um, uh, extremely popular with the burmese public and um, you know, Mei Online is widely uh, despised even before he launched the military coup um, you know, because of his, uh, <laughs> of the, uh, the fact that he is the rather um, you know um, arrogant um, um, general, unlike the previous um, um, uh, dictator General Tan Shui who was a smooth operator and who set up this quasi-democratic reform. And so because after the elections in 2020, Aung San Suu Kyi and party uh, were re-elected uh, in, in the national general election um, and they, they were re-elected with overwhelming majority, you know. So the, all the proxy parties that military set up to compete against Aung San Suu Kyi and National League for Democracy Party were nearly crushed. So therefore the military had no political cards seriously to play within the parliament. They, you know, control 25% of the seats. Um, then there was this, um, uh, established fact that um, May Online and Aung San Suu Kyi could not work out a deal for the um, uh, May Online's, you know, and well-known ambition to become the president when he retired from the Burmese armed forces, and all of these things, plus the military was as an institution um, starting to feel that its uh, privileges and prerogatives may be slipping away from its hand. So all these things contributed to 
the the coup of February um, two and a half years ago, and that this time the even larger national protest movement erupted larger than uh, the one that um, my generation from 1988 we're in our 20s um, you know witnessed and I was already in the United States and so I was not part of the 1988 uh, protest movement in Burma but um, I was um, you know supporting the protest movement and then later uh, when the students uh, fled the country to the uh, Burmese and Thai border areas and set up an uh, armed resistance movement uh, named All Burma Democratic Students Front. Um, I was supporting them in any um, way I can. So anyway, to, to bring back to the coup, um, the, the coup and the protest movement, which it triggered, um, uh, you know, turned violent. Uh, the the protest movement turned violent, not because the people wanted to be violent or people chose violence, but the military was using um, snipers, not riot police or riot, um, you know, the crowd control uh, civilian police force, but they were using army snipers to pick out. Um, you know, visible, uh, the particularly young women, young and beautiful women that were um, either uh, leading the protests or uh, participating in the street protest in, you know, cities like uh, Mandalay, my own, um, you know, hometown, and also the the the, the capital city, Naypyidaw and Yango. And, and also they were beginning to... Um, uh, execute, uh, you know, activists uh, summarily, you know, the extrajudicial killings has started. So then the the protesters realized that, um, you know, peaceful protest um, would only um, basically, you know, create a situation where the military and the coup regime um, where um, they're killing activists um, wantonly. So therefore, a, a segment of, I mean, I should say a large number of uh, young Burmese, um, the protesters from all walks of life, decided that they would take up arms. So we have, uh, one thing I didn't mention um, up until now is that we have had um, minority ethnic armed resistance movements that have sprung up at different periods in our modern history since 1948. Um, that's the year we regained our independence from Britain. So these national minority armed resistance movements are located along um, border regions of Burma. So, you know, the, we border with India and Bangladesh on the west. Um, and then like, you know, on the east, um, China, and then on, on the east and south part of um, uh, the country uh, are shared with the um, uh, Thai borders. And then we have a small borders with Laos. Um, and so the Myanmar Spring Revolution protesters, you know, even before they took up arms, their protest movement, you know, label itself Myanmar Spring Revolution. So these peaceful revolutionaries or anti coup protesters left the cities and towns and um, you know, uh, found their ways to different um, ethnic um, armed organizations and underwent, um, you know, guerrilla training, uh, sabotage training, and then formed different units 
um, either under the uh, direct commandership of the existing armed ethnic organizations or um, with those armed organizations' help, they form their own uh, what is known as politically, uh, sorry, um, people's defense forces. So, so currently there are estimated five or 600 different, um, you know, um, uh, PDFs of people's defense forces across the country, um, you know, uh, fighting back the military. So this was a, a, a unprecedented feature of the um, a protest movement that came out or that came out against the military coup. And then there's also another component. Uh, uh, unlike the previous waves of um, anti-military um, protests um, since 1962, when the coup, uh, the very first coup uh, was launched, the spring revolution of 2020 um, had this unprecedented component, which is civil service uh, personnel, you know, that's like um, you know, state officials, public officials, um, you know, bureaucrats mainly uh, from all sectors, health and education, uh, finance, even, um, you know, the, some low level policemen and army officers, you know, these are all like um, uh, teachers. Uh, they all decided to empty out um, you know, administra the administration uh, of the state. So therefore the military um, would not be able to govern or rule um, without, you know, the, uh, um, the democratic consent of the people. So the idea was uh, to cripple the military administratively so it could issue commands and orders uh, to state different state organs but those state organs run by civilians, or at least I staff by civilians, um, you know, overwhelmingly, uh, that would no longer be functional. So the idea is like uh, to to essentially empty out uh, the power of the military from different organs of the state, except the one that it controls uh, tightly, which is the armed forces. So over the last um, two and a half years. Um, you know the the protest movement and um, you know now armed resistance uh, in collaboration with a number of um, major ethnic armed organizations such as Korean National Uni um, Union, uh, the Kachin Independence Organization, uh, Chin National Front. Uh, you know these are like the, the, the different ethnic uh, resistance groups and their names, and so. That, um, you know, um, loose coalition of majoritarian Burmese um, activists working together um, with the armed ethnic uh, resistance organizations um, has defied um, any type of expert prediction or projection that, you know, this time again, the Burmese military would um, uh, wipe out the protest movement as it did in the past. Um, but here we are, uh, two and a half years later, this armed resistance movement continues and civil disobedient movement um, is still in place. But I think um, at this point, we are you know, looking at a situation where um, you know, the loose coalition of anti-coup, um, pro-democracy resistance, um, organizations and movements, and uh, uh, the, the military, uh, known as the common enemy, um, are approaching the stalemate. In other words, we are in a situation where the zero sum, you know, total defeat of the other is not possible. 
Um, and so, so the 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 most important point uh, to take away from my uh, observation here is that um, uh, Burma as a nation is at a stalemate. Um, you know, the there's no way the uh, the civilian and ethnic resistance organizations will crush the military uh, because of uh, the one because of one major um, factor, which is none of the neighboring country uh, countries around Burma has come forward to provide any type of either humanitarian access to IDPs. We have uh, close to two million. Uh, that's in addition to one million uh, Rohingya refugees um, that are in uh, Bangladesh, which um, you know my uh, Rohingya uh, brother Habib will talk about. Uh, he will focus on the Rohingya struggle. So I'll I'll just uh, um, say um, you know uh, my concluding remarks here, which is um, without uh, the frontier or border um, the front line states and uh, nearby, uh, you know. Uh, shifting uh, their cooperation and collaboration with the Burmese military dictatorship, um, it is very, very difficult to see um, a situation where the democratic uh, resistance will crush the military, uh, make them surrender, or make them um, come to the dialogue table. Um, the, and top, uh, and I think there are two major. Um, Asian powers that are fully backing the Burmese military, that have been backing the Burmese military since um, you know 1988. That's China and India. And so we've got sanctions from the United States, the European Union. So the sanctions hurt them. They are needed, but they are not enough. Uh, we are not receiving any type of um, you know material assistance from any democratic uh, countries that now openly, um, you know, sent um, hundreds of billions um, worth of arms and supplies to Ukraine. Of course, uh, Burma is not, a, or the Burmese democracy movement is not considered important or, or important enough to make it a proxy of the United States or any other uh, corporate sector. So it just, you know, the outside world, particularly democratic world, just let the Burmese um, um, man-made um, tragedy to unfold. And so we are looking at um, at a stalemate. Uh, the longer the stalemate continues, um, the greater the human cost uh, to the Burmese people and the greater the damage to the economy, to the society, and the prospect for any type of uh, you know reconciliation and uh, freedom, and so it's 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 a rather um, grim scenario I'm painting here, uh, but I have uh, focused on um, on Myanmar affairs as a professional student as well as as a deeply involved activist over the last thirty years. So I, as a scholar, I must speak what I find. But as an activist, um, I don't like what I find, and I want to change it. And so, you know, this this is the dilemma of uh, um, some of us who uh, are both the trained scholars, but with the with our heart in the right place, and um, want to change the ugly realities on the ground. I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Zani. We'll come back to you in discussion. And please remember to check out Mong Zani's publication, 4C.co. And before I forget, there will be an opportunity to meet Mong Zani when he comes to Melbourne next month. Uh, and yep, Socialist Alliance and Green Left will be hosting a public forum on August 31st at the Resistance Centre, level 5407 Swanson Street. And now I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Habib. Habib is the founder and spokesperson of the Australian Burmese Rohingya Organization. Welcome, Habib. Uh, 
Hi, good morning, everyone. First, I would like to say my acknowledgement to Wurundjeris and Wurundj peoples and Aborigines and Territories uh, Islanders and Elders past and present and senior citizens and also thanks to Socialist Alliance, Grain, Grain Labs and also all volunteer and also Glowy and also cameramen we have and all attendance to make this meeting happen. And thanks again for letting me speak about our Rohingya issue. Thank you very much. As you aware, for decades, there are ongoing attacks against Rohingyas and other minorities. The, situa the situ situation now being worsening since Myanmar's spring revolution from the last two and a half years. In these two and a half years, more than 3,000 people have been killed, 14,000 people have been detained, and some of them are in death row. Displacing over two million people across the country, ten of thousands of houses have been burned down, mostly in Sagai and Magwe regions, where the situation can be compared with Rohingya crisis. Also destroying crops, stocks, and their businesses. It is widely causing destabilized peace and security of the people, and as well as for environment. In the middle of the existing military genocides, that is the first one, and second one, we have Myanmar Spring Crisis, and then post-cyclone Mosha, and we have armed struggle of Arkan Army. So in these four crises, so I will represent about how the Rohingya are struggling in the middle of this. Because of ongoing genocidal attacks against Rohingya community and failure of international protection regimes, in Rakhine State alone, inside Myanmar, we have 400,000 to 600,000 Rohingya are still systematically trapped with constant arrest and torture since 2012. Of them, 120,000 to 140,000 are in 17 internationally uh, internally displaced camps across Situe town since 2012. Displaced Rohingya and Kamen from one of the town, Chaupiu towns, called Chautalong camps, and then Miebong, there is called Taumbo camps, mountain camps. They've been forcefully moved out to temporary shelter without any arrangement for their livelihood by military forces. Just recently, I think last month, uh, they done this already. In Bangladesh, we have 723,000 Rohingya flat between 2012 to 2017 are still in 33 refugee camps of Bangladesh. And those flat in 1992 and some left in 78 are in two other refugee camps, numbering about 280,000 they are also still in there. So over 1.1 million Rohingyas are in Bangladesh today. In India, we have more than 40,000 enter into India between 2012 to 17. 20,000 of them are registered with UNHCR, both registered or unregistered face harassment and living in fear of deportation under Indian Prime Minister Modi government. I think some of them also already deported around in 2017 to 2022. In Thailand, we have about 20,000 Rohingya arrived by land and also through international water. The life of Rohingya in Thailand is clandestine. And over 470 or about 470 are in, in Thailand detention center, according to report came out from last year. But we don't know now where they are because UNHCR is not allowed to assess for screening of these boat people arrival, refugees who are detained. In Malaysia, we have 140,000 Rohingyas arrived by boats and land in between early 1990 until 2023. They too have experience of arrest, detention, and deportation. Assessed to, according to UNHCR, about 100,000 and 5,330 registered by the end of May 2023, 
Both registered and unregistered Rohingya refugees are in constant vulnerable to extortion, arrest, indefinite detention, depend on type of rate and political situation in there. Also, I would like to include the number of Rohingya living in Saudi Arabia. There are about 558,000 Rohingya living in Saudi Arabia. They arrived in there since 1978 and mostly in 1992. The government, in some point, to the agree to offer legal status for them, but revokes when the government changes. Every year, hundreds of Rohingya detained and deported to Bangladesh and Pakistan because they were said to be, they were forced to say they are from Bangladesh or Pakistan and they deport them somehow. The number of Rohingya profile remain high in the country of Bangladesh, Thailand, and also India and Malaysia, and also Saudi Arabia. Despite they are vulnerable Rohingya refugees, and they, are, they need international protection, and mostly they are women and children, but they left abandoned. That's why their number remain still high. Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, Thailand, Malaysia, and India assess for no education, no work rights, no livelihood, no chances for resettlement to a third country either. Particularly from Bangladesh, they are facing permanent encampment with the risk of kidnapping, human trafficking, and also natural disaster. Because this region are not in Europe. The struggle of Rohingya people are hardly and very badly on daily basics. Therefore, some of them are trying to reach for a safer place through secondary migration to another country through international water. For example, those in Myanmar, inside Myanmar, they are departing for neighboring countries. Those in neighboring country from Bangladesh, they are departing for Thailand or Malaysia. Those in Thailand and Malaysia departing for another third country. This has been happening every year, and we have hundreds of people drawn to death and missing in international water. Today, you can see in Bangladesh, 60% of them are children, and another 20% or 15% are women. So men number are very less because since they arrived in Bangladesh in 2017, they fled. We have 40,000 are orphaned. Their parents were killed inside Myanmar. And again in Bangladesh, all the male and whoever have money above 18, they are departing for another country. So only women and children are left in Bangladesh. That's why you can see the figure number, mostly 60% to 70% are women and children, and mostly the children under eight will see they are about 60%. Recently, Cyclone Mocha hit badly in Rakhine State on 14th of May, swept with 250 kilometer per hour, wind very strong, destructed over 90% of houses, over 500 people dead, of them, 400 people are Rohingyas, mostly from IDP camp of Sitwe. Because Rohingya are not allowed to leave the IDP camp, no security authority had arranged for their safe place for this entire 120 or 40,000 people. The Arkan army, on the other hand, somehow able to locate to a safe place with their own limited resources for other Rakhine people and other community, including of some Rohingya, those are not in IDP. And also, Arkan Army is providing aid and assistance for recovery from Cyclone Mocha. However, military junta, in another hand, blocked international aid, arresting local workers, restricted aid distribution for Rohingya in IDP camps. Overall, about 90% of total population of 3.2 million of people in Rakhine State are in need of food, clean water, sanitation, relief medication, and shelter. There are some aid distribution coming through local individual and local aid organization, but these aid are not reaching to IDB camp of where Rohingyas are. When Myanmar, the country Myanmar needs strong action and sanction to ease ongoing brutalities, the international community and United Nations show very weak position, failing even to deliver aid for saving life. International community and United Nations have well known about the brutal behavior of Myanmar military junta at least from the year 2012. 
It is therefore international community and United Nations must use appropriate force in whatever means in order to save the life of vulnerable people and to normalize situation on the ground. Despite their worsening situation of Rohingya and even for Rakhine people on the ground, the Myanmar military junta is reaching bilateral agreement with Bangladesh for repatriation of Rohingya with uncertainty without guarantee of safety and dignified return with financial reparation for what they had lost. We Rohingya found that this repatriation attempt is not genuine, but a confutation for ICG hearing. Even this repatriation plan go ahead in some point. There is a serious question for the length of the process of repatriation and number of repatriation per each pilot. For example, the government has agreed to take 1,500 per one month in each pilot, so this will take 30 years for repatriation of one million people. Inside Myanmar, Myanmar military junta, who is the main perpetrator, making sure all the time the Rohingya situation remain unchanged and deny every right of Rohingya. The people of Myanmar, including Rohingya, have been suffering enough. Therefore, international community and United Nations should not fail again and again. Current political figure in Myanmar is different from the past. We have now more than 500 to 600 armed resistance groups. This included National United Government, NUG, and People Defense Force, PDF, and CDM, and Local Defense Force, and then armed ethnic groups, those exist since Independence Day. In Rakhine State, we have Arkan Army, is leading to liberate Rakhine State from the rest of Myanmar, where it has also formed its own justice and administration system within its control region. In this arena, it is essential to dialogue with all groups, including with Arkan Army. It is time for the international community and United Nations have to use appropriate power over military junta and also to lay out platform to work with all resistant group in order to form people represent a genuine government, a righteous, good government system for the future of the country Myanmar and also to save the people of Myanmar. In this way, all displaced people both internally and internationally could able to return home peacefully and rebuild their life as well as this effort will help to establish and stabilize the region and the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Habib. And I encourage people to read Habib's book called First They Erased Us. And uh, yeah, before we open it up for discussion, I would just like to plug Green Left. Uh, you know, while you're thinking about things that you might like to ask Mongzani or Habib, just want to remind people to become a supporter of Green Left. This conference is being hosted by Green Left. We bring you activist news on a daily basis, and we've been going for 32 years and rely on the generosity of our subscribers. So if you like the work that we, we do and you want us to keep doing it and you know, where you want us to keep putting on really great conferences like this, uh, you can become a subscriber today for as little as $5 a month. It's really easy to do that by going to greenleft.org.au slash supporter. So do it now. And also, um, the people live streaming, please think about supporting Green Left People Powered Media. So now let's open it up for discussion. If you would like to ask Mongzani or Habib just indicate to me. Uh, this session will be live streamed, so please just be aware that if you are asking a question or making a point for discussion, that it will be filmed and will eventually go public on YouTube. Uh, can I just take Sue Bolton? And then we'll have Nick. Yep, come up the front. Yeah, you gotta come up. So I've got a couple of questions for both speakers. 
Um, firstly, for Dr. Mongzani, um, I heard you speak um, earlier this year in Melbourne when you visited, and you mentioned um, in your talk, uh, which was more direct, uh, more with the Rohingya community and the Myanmar community, um, that if Aung San Suu Kyi had taken a stronger stand in around 2012, that perhaps the um, genocide against the Rohingya people might not have occurred. So I was just wondering if you could sort of talk a little bit about that. And secondly, for Habib, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how all of the different ethnic armies and protest movements are working together and if um, there's more of um, more um, incorporation of the Rohingya struggle in with the um, overall struggle against the military junta, like if the level of cooperation and working together of all the groups. Yeah, now we have Nico, so we'll, we'll try to take three speakers and then throw it back to the speakers. Um, hello, uh, my question is to Dr. Mong Zani. It's quite amazing um, that, you know, theoretically, um, you should have won. You know, you've got all the solitary, the um, civilian sector non cooperating, and should have brought the, um, the jaunter down. But my question is how can you win the army over? Thank you. And was there someone else with their hand up? Right. Jim, did you want to go? Was there anyone else that wanted to ask a question? Maybe would you like us to bring the mic to you? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Mongzani, we might just take four, uh, if that's okay. So we're going to have Jim McElroy and then one more and then we'll throw it back to you. Oh, thanks very much to both the speakers. It's really <coughs> a fascinating um, situation that we have in uh, Myanmar, Burma. Um, the, I mean, I wonder if you could comment on how much of the territory, I have heard a figure of half the territory of Burma is in the control of the democratic forces or, or of or of uh, resistance forces of one kind or another. Is that kind of figure correct? Um, which would seem on the face of it a base for, in a, the medium term, to weaken the regime to a point that, you know, it's possible that a, a revolution could take place. Um, now, the second question is just in regards to the Rohingya. I, I'd like to hear about the situation of Rohingya refugees in Australia. I mean, how many Rohingya refugees are there in Australia and what is the situation? Are they being um, blocked from uh, providing with visas and so on? Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Bram Heinrich McPartland. Um, I'm predominantly a disability activist. I had a question specific to that, actually, which is within the Rohingya, um, within the Rohingya community and within Myanmar in general, uh, is there information specific to what's happening to uh, survivors of armed conflicts, people who've been injured or disabled by the armed conflict? Uh, how, how is that being approached? Is there any approach to support refugees in particular who are going to other countries who are disabled? Are they being disproportionately um, targeted by other governments? And um, if so, I suppose, how much of that has to do with uh, injury? Um, from the armed conflicts themselves. Sorry. Thank you for your question. Mongzani, would you be able to respond to some of those or all of those questions? Yeah, I think the, uh, the first uh, two questions um, 
paper directly related to what I was uh, <clears throat> um, talking and also uh, particularly uh, Sue's uh, question about you know, uh, whether Aung San Suu Kyi uh, should have stepped in and uh, nip the uh, you know rising um, tide of um, populist hatred uh, you know, which was whipped up by the military um, I think that we have to put that in a broader context uh, you know, the uh, to, to to get a full picture um, so that it would not simply be uh, you know hypothetical or academ academic you know what should have been done and what could have been done um, in I believe it was uh, April or June or April of 2012 uh, the Burmese you know quasi democratic government or President Thane Singh uh, ex general held uh, by elections there were about um, 45 or 43 seats that were contested. And and uh, just on the eve of these by-elections, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, party decided um, uh, to participate in this, uh, you know, uh, quasi-democratic uh, uh, dem um, electoral process that the military presided over. Uh, under the civilian head. Um, they contested about 43 out of 45, and I think that they won all, every single seat. So essentially, in the by-election, the main um, rivals of the National League for Democracy uh, was the, the military proxy party made up of uh, ex-rank-and-file officers and ex-generals. So essentially, in that by-election of 2012 a, uh, April, the party was uh, the uh, the military proxy party was effectively wiped out. So the the the, uh, the public demand for further democratization uh, reforms were becoming uh, louder and more strident, and uh, from my own. Um, you know, uh, research have discovered that the military decided uh, that they needed to divert the public attention away from this, you know, uh, democratic reform process um, and uh, the discourse of human rights, environmental protections, you know, in, in Rakhine State, um, you know, where the, <clears throat> the one third of the population where uh, Rohingya people and the other uh, two thirds were uh, Rakhines and others, um, you know, non Rakhine uh, communities. And so, in that part of um, uh, Burma, in the western uh, Burmese state of Rakhine, where um, there were major natural gas explorations and, um, you know, uh, production were taking place, that the Rakhine activists were not concerned about Rohingya people at all. They were protesting against the, what they consider uh, the military and central Burmese administration taking all the uh, precious, you know, hydrocarbons, uh, natural gas. We have uh, one of the ten largest natural gas reserves in the world at the time, and so they wanted, um, you know, a fair share of uh, revenues generated out of this natural gas, and they were demanding. Uh, you know, fair distribution of uh, um, revenues from Rakhine State um, to Rakhine people against the wishes of the military and the military control reformist um, um, government in Nepidaw. And so then on top of that, as I mentioned, Aung San Suu Kyi party wiped out the military proxy. And so the military decided that they needed something very potent and more potent than you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> democracy and human rights in terms of public sentiment. So that is when they, um, you know, started to mobilize, um, you know, the, uh, the 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 Burmese uh, uh, populist um, racism against, uh, you know, darker skinned people, 
uh, go into the uh, dark skin people and of course like some some are also lighter skin so the the, the various skin tones but the, nonetheless they are um the predominantly muslims and uh, there is um, you know long before Aung San Suu Kyi or the military um islamophobia and uh, also the um, dislike of people of indian descent and you know that uh, both uh, types of uh, racism and bigotry were born out of the uh, colonial uh, context as the British, um, you know, uh, ruled, uh, <clears throat> involved the divide and rule uh, among different ethnic and religious communities. So, so at the time when this was, uh, you know, the military was beginning to mobilize that uh, this Islamophobia and dislike of uh, uh, anyone uh, with the Indian ancestry in Burma, um, there was... Uh, you know, no pushback from the opposition side. At the time, Aung San Suu Kyi was the leader of the opposition. There was no pushback from the Burmese intellectual um, or academics, writers, movie stars. And, and Aung San Suu Kyi kept, um, you know, a strategic or studied silence. And then some of us were aware that the military was beginning to, uh, you know, uh, mobilize this hatred um, or like prejudice um, against the Rohingyas. But, you know, look, I, I've written um, you know, quite extensively on this subject. And so, it, you know, the, um, the, you can find the, um, the, um, the literature on this subject, um, you know, very well documented. And genocides are, uh, are not crimes of passion. They don't take place overnight. They require, um, you know, um, organization, premeditation, um, you know, ideological mobilization and structures of violence. And so it's like militias, like, you know, po the um, uh, popular masses, uh, the, you know, the security forces, police, all of them working in unison to establish or to not to establish, to embark on this uh, mass uh, destruction of Rohingya people. And, and Suu Kyi was in a position at the time she was, seen as somebody who could walk on water in terms of reforms and human rights and you know she was feted around the world and had such um you know a quantity of moral influence if not political power she was still the opposition leader and she stayed silent and some of us started to speak out but you know we were we were all grassroots organizers and activists with um, you know on um a, a little influence over public opinion opinion but the one uh, who had that kind of moral influence over burmese national public opinion was suchi and she failed and that's why i could never uh, you know that um, say she was innocent she knew she had that uh, you know moral influence and uh, she either did not understand why that influence should have been used to, to prevent uh, you know the mass uh, destruction of a community or she she agreed with the military that Rohingyas did not belong in Burma and therefore whatever was done to them was acceptable to her and uh, after all in the end she ended up traveling to the International Court of Justice dismissing and denying that the military uh, was engaged in genocidal campaign against Rohingya. So this was, uh, you know, just uh, before the pandemic. Uh, on the second question, very briefly, how do we win the military over? If you mean winning by winning over the military, uh, changing the mindset of the military or the military having a change of heart, I don't think either scenario is possible because uh, they're like, um, you know, uh, it, they are like an opium addict or drug addict. Um, they are addicted to power. They are addicted to the ability to dominate, control, and do what they want with a blanket impunity, either domestically or internationally. And they are protected by China and Russia. And so I, I, I think um, the military does not um, uh, show any signs that even after this uh, destruction, carnage, and you know, basically, the devastating 
impact on the future of the country and the, the current affairs of the, uh, the country, uh, the livelihoods, um, you know, they show no signs that uh, they are reflecting on their role in, you know, vast destruction of the country. So I, I just don't see um, how that can be done. And so it, 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 it is becoming a highly protracted and almost intractable situation like uh, Palestine. And after all, the, the violent, um, you know, conf conflict and contest of power in Burma have been going on. Uh, um, you know, three months after, since three months after the independence um, from Britain, 1948. So this is not new. So we have been in this uh, internal conflict, or I should say conflicts, uh, multiple conflicts involving multiple actors over the last uh, 70 years. And so I just cannot find any evidence, uh, you know, that will allow me to say that we can win the military over or that this could uh, and in um, you know peaceful manner. Thanks, Zani. And just to let people know, we need to wrap up this session in the next ten to fifteen minutes. And, and Zani, um, I know you need to leave soon, but maybe you have time to just respond to maybe one or two more questions. But Habib, can you also maybe respond to some of the questions? Yep. Maybe yep. address the question regarding people of disability. Sorry, there was a question about the disability. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Please. So, Habib, did you want to come to the mic? Yeah, yeah I will quickly go there for question one. Uh, first thing I would like to say, Rohingya support Myanmar Spring. And recently we have, uh, we already have uh, one Rohingya guy, Aung Cho Mo. He is uh, the advisor to Myanmar uh, NUG, NUG Myanmar Human Rights Commission. And he has been promoted yesterday, I think, uh, as a vice chairman for Myanmar Human Rights Commission uh, under National United Government. And our Rohingya term is, the military is, uh, let's say, common enemy. So this military must go, and the rest we can talk within other, with other ethnic group. And, and in local uh, people defense force cdm and local armed forces there are many muslim there are many muslim from yangon sagai magwe they join as well but not sure about the number of rohingya because rohingya are very they are in under very scare position but in overseas rohingya people join with uh, nug government and many other protests that leading in front of embassy and many way around the world and including for fundraising and all but you have to remember in for rohingya is two issue one is national unity government who is leading including with pdf and cdm and all but we are from rakhine state rohingya are from rakhine state where aa has different policy arkan army so they are also trying to liberate Arkana State from the rest of Myanmar to, to establish own independent state. So for Rohingya, we don't know who will win, and we have to be with who. We don't know. If Arkan army win fast, and we have to be under them. But we support both of their taxes, removal of military, or liberate the state. So we support both of them including in Arkan Army, in some the administration, in local grounds, some, all, already some Rohingya has joined in there as well, but not in armed forces. Uh, territorial control, I have to say it is very hard because at the moment now, uh, the, uh, we are in revolutionary position. And we have to say 50% is partially controlled, because of the unbalancing in military position. Uh, Xin community leaders from Xin state in recent meeting, they claim they have been control over 50% of territory and they have nearly 20 to 30,000 armed forces so they can well control their states. That is what the Xin leader has claimed. And Arkan army, they claim they have already 70% of territory has been controlled and they can rule over Arkan. But we're not sure the game is not over yet. And for question three, uh, the, I mean question four, for visa process for Rohingya, uh, 
I think we have over 1,000 Rohingya arrive in between 2009 to until the policy changed 2013 to 14, and just about 1,000 number. And those arrive uh, before 2012 August. 90% of them have permanent visa, but the rest, all of them, have no visa yet. But recently, after Labour government come in from last year, said to be uh, giving uh, protection visa. So only a few, I think, got a protection visa. Uh, let's say from one, two percent from Geelong and one, two percent from Mowell and one person from Spring Bell. So the number is not reached yet to 10. So not even one percent. Uh, said to be processing within six months or one year, but it is not happened yet. It looked like slow down again. So we don't know what's going on. Yeah, and, and it is very hard to say, you know, so I don't know exactly what to say. So it being uh, the, under the Liberal government already, three government has changed, nine years over, now ten years over, so the situation is 99% still remains same. And survivor of armed conflicts, uh, we have to say, because the, the country, Myanmar, is not like a, a country in European country or democratic countries, you know, and, and there is even local, forget about Rohingya, local people are not assessed for medication. Even recent Cyclone Mocha, the government blocked AIDS and arresting the people who are helping, arresting teachers and arresting doctors. So people are left abandoned. If military found them, someone is treating them or someone providing, they arrest them. So it is very hard to say inside Myanmar. There is no special treatment. But in Bangladesh, yes, there has, because uh, IOM and Bangladesh, many local organization, NGOs and international NGOs, yeah, they, they've been getting some form of assistance. I have to say that all. I, because, you know, from the past two and a half years since Myanmar Spring, we have over two million displaced, mostly in Sagai and Magwe. People are burned down alive, with the houses, with the crops, the bars, that, that been, you can go, search through Google. So the unleash military, they, they don't care, you know. So over two million men, we are not in Europe. That is what I mentioned. There's no neighboring country has already upset with refugees and they don't welcome them. You know, Thai border closed and Bangladesh border closed and Indian border closed. Indian government trying to, the, forcing them to back to Myanmar. So the situation is very bad. People are in the jungle. Let's say two million people displaced. They have no houses, no place to live, no food, no clean water. They are in the jungle. Maybe 100,000 they cross into the India border, maybe 50 or 30,000, and Thai border, 100,000. But where are the rest, 1.5 million? How they've been living? We don't know. It is very hard position. So because we are not in Europe, that's why international community and United Nations, it is time for they have to use appropriate power. They have to use power. Thank you. Thank you, Habib. We do need to wrap up. Apologies, we probably don't have time to take any more questions. I would like to plug that Mongzani is also coming for an event organised at Monash University, also on August 31st. I would like to thank both speakers today, Mongzani and Habib. Habib will be sticking around at the conference, so please feel free to go and chat to him during the day. Uh, and thank you for all of your attendance here and online. There will be a plenary session starting quite soon at 11.30 in, in, solidarity, in this Solidarity Hall, and it's entitled, The Fight for Democracy in India, Is Modi Fascist? Finally, if you have only bought a single ticket a session ticket and would like to attend the rest of the conference, you can upgrade to a full day ticket for only 10 or $20. Uh, and just lastly, I've heard First Nations people welcoming the Rohingya to Aboriginal land at rallies and they've spoken of genocide here in Australia and in Myanmar as a product of colonialism worldwide. And we want solidarity with the Rohingya to grow. So thank you once again and please stay in touch.